It's my privilege to introduce our speaker today. Pastor Mike Minner was born in Providence, Rhode Island into a Navy family after attending the Naval Academy, Old Dominion University, and Florida Bible College. He started Reston Bible Church in 1974, where he still serves as senior pastor. His first book, entitled A Western Jesus, takes a fresh look at what it means to follow Christ. Now in his fourth decade of ministry, Pastor Mentor is a coveted speaker. He is known for his great insight into God's word, keen ability to communicate it in a way that is relevant to the 21st century believer and for his appeal to both adults and youth in all stages of their walk with Christ. Mike and Kay live in Virginia and have four grown children and six grandchildren. Would you join me in welcoming Pastor Mike Mentor to our chapel today? Well, good morning, Dallas Theological Seminary. At least I assume it's morning. It's mid-August here in Virginia where I'm teaching from. Um, I want to thank the uh, students and the faculty and the staff for having me and certainly my good friend who I've not seen in about 46 years, Joe Allen. I assume he's probably been the one that's uh, introduced me. Um, to let you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not a scholar. Uh, I've only had two years of Bible college, but when I, when I was in Bible college and when I got out, I sort of cut my teeth on people like Howard Hendricks, uh, J. Dwight Pentecost, uh, Walford, Ryrie, Stanley Toussaint. Those are the people that I listened to their messages, Swindoll, that helped me along in my, in my theological journey. Also, our uh, very first missionary that we ever took on was Cornelio Rivera. He's also a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. And I believe the first mission speaker we had was Ramesh Richards. And that was way, way back, even in the 70s. So with that, uh, I just want you to know that I'm not going to be opening my Bible uh, today and giving some sort of an exposition. That would be preaching. That's for another time. What I want to tell you is what I've learned over the last 46 years that I've been in, in ministry in, uh, in here in Virginia. And I hope to sort of distill some of my thoughts that might be helpful to you, uh, the students, and anybody that's here that's listening. But uh, I'm so blessed just to be able to have this privilege. I wish I could be there in person. That was the original plan, but this strange virus, I don't know if you've heard of it, has come up and it's kept me from being able to be a part maybe another time. So let me start by saying... I'm going to break this down into sort of three uh, parts, not necessarily a three-part three sermon, but three areas that I would distill my thinking and, and ministry into over the years. And there's a lot of things I could obviously say, having been a pastor for a long time. But I would start with this. When you entered the Christian life, no matter how old you were, uh, you entered a theological swim lane. That's what I call it, a theological swim lane. Some people might call it a tribe or a group, whatever. I just simply call it a, a theological swim lane. By that, I mean that when you came to Christ, maybe you, were, you came out of a Christian home and you went to a particular church, Presbyterian, Baptist, you know, evangelical free, Bible church, whatever. Uh, or maybe you were in college and it was Campus Crusade or InterVarsity or Young Life or something. But keep in mind, you still entered a swim lane, a theological swim lane. And that may all be good. They all have their various views on various doctrinal issues. They all hold to the, to the sound gospel that salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. But there are varying views. And I think the tendency that I have learned through the years is when you're in a particular swim lane, you think that your swim lane, because of what you've been taught, is the only one that is right. It's got the purest water and all the other swim lanes, though they might make it into the kingdom, they're a little polluted along the way. And I just would encourage you in this. As you go to Dallas, you're going to be sitting under some of the finest teaching anywhere in the world. Some of the greatest professors, as I said, the ones that I, that I learned a great deal from. But we all know uh, that Dallas has a, a certain view, and Westminster's got a certain view, and Denver and a lot of different seminaries have different views, things a little uh, emphasis on. I would suggest this if you're a student and you're thinking of going into ministry, read widely. That's what I like to refer to as a wide-angle lens. 
uh, when you get out, you're going to be challenged. You'll be challenged by a lot of the things that you're learning here, and these are good things that you're learning. And my theology has not changed much. It's changed a little. But it used to be extremely narrow by what I was taught, and I've, I've widened that lens a little bit, and there are times when I widen it a lot just to hear what other sides have to say, different perspectives. Uh, so I heard this a number of years ago from a friend of mine. I do not know who to give credit to, but listen carefully to this. If you're taught before you read, what you read is what you were taught. If you're taught that the church is a building, hey, let's go down to the church, let's go to church, then when you see church in the Bible, you'll see a building. If you're taught that baptism always means water, every time you see the word baptism, you'll think of, of water. If you're taught before you read, what you read is what you were taught. And so we have to be very, very careful to open the scriptures, to listen to other people with that wide-angle lens to learn. Because some of the difficult passages and doctrines and things that, that you wrestle with in your swim lane may very well be explained in another swim lane. This is why we need to take down the dividers. Now, I'm not here to tell you exactly uh, every issue. I'm not saying cast out doctrine, hold hands, and sing kumbaya. But I am saying that we've narrowed things a little bit too much, I think, and it's caused a lot of disunity. I remember having the privilege many, many years ago where I was at a, a seminar taught by the great Dr. J.I. Packer, who passed away recently. And during one of the breaks, I asked Dr. Packer out for lunch, and he didn't have a lunch plan, so I took him out to a, a little pizza place. Pizza with Packer, I still remember it. This was like 42, 43 years ago. And he had written, Knowing God, and one of the things we, we talked about was the issue of being certain about doctrine. He said, you know something? I'm off doctrinally. I just don't know where. He said, I know for a fact I couldn't possibly be batting a thousand. I thought it was a very humble, very humble response. But when my theology really got pressed up against the wall, and I hope none of you mind this, but I'm just going to tell you uh, since I'm a guest speaker, um, my theology got challenged about 11 years ago. When I say challenge, I mean some of it was really pressed up against the wall. I got involved with a mission called Justice Mercy International, and I've been with them for about 11 years now. And I go to the Amazon every year, and we get in a little boat, we travel up, and I train jungle pastors. I mean jungle pastors. These people live in the jungle, some deep, some on the banks, and after a while, I, I was going from village to village teaching. Then eventually we built a center, and they come to me. And we started with 25. We're now up to about a total of about 300 that are now coming out, about 150 per time. I, don't, I only go once a year now. It's a little difficult for me to travel that much and to be away from the pulpit. But when I got there, I began to realize that these people um, – had a, they didn't have a different theology per se. They held to the, to the basics. They would die for the gospel. But their experiences as to how they came to Christ were per perplexing to me. And I, because I would ask every single one of them, or somebody would get their testimony. And I was beginning to find out these people were saying, Oh, I was, I was in the middle of the jungle. And I, uh, I was involved in drug trafficking way back in the jungle, sneaking drugs into villages and so on. And then one day, you know, I. I, I heard about Jesus, and I didn't want to have anything to do with him, so I ran deeper into the jungle, and then I saw a light, and the light wouldn't leave me alone, and it kept driving me back, and it would eventually drive them to a person who would give them the gospel. And I thought, wait a minute, what is this? This went out when the canon of Scripture was closed. This went out in the, in the first century, or when the last apostle died. You pick. And I began to realize, no, these are real stories, and I would be here for a long time if I told you some of the most bizarre stories you have ever heard in your life as to how some of these people came to know Christ. And they don't have terribly mystical experiences, but sometimes when it comes to that, they're, they're, they're amazing. And then I begin to realize there were things that they were doing that I've never seen done in the States. You'd almost think of them as primitive or not having a lot of theological training. One of the churches, once a month, has a week where they, the whole church comes together, about 100 of them, and they pray from 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. Five hours, seven straight days. If my math is correct, that's 35 hours of prayer. You know of a church in America that does that? 
every time I meet with them, I say, you're my heroes. I know the Bible technically better than you do, but you know Jesus better than I do. And so my wide-angle lens, I listen to these people. Even though it goes up against some of my theological persuasions or even biases, and I listen to their stories, and I watch their lives, and I see the godliness that they have, and I see the way they get the gospel up and down the Amazon. I see their willingness to die for the gospel, to do anything for the gospel, and the stories are utterly amazing. They have no desire to come to the States. They have no desire for materialism. They want to live for Christ and die for Christ. So that was, this is this whole idea of, of the swim lane, and these people are in different swim lanes that I would be in in some areas, but I listen and I learn a lot about the person of Jesus that I don't get with my precise theology. And it's not just a matter of experience, it's actually seeing the living Jesus in the lives of people that are just utterly amazing. The second thing I would like to say that I've learned through the years, and I think this is, a, this is just really important, and that is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. We interchange those an awful lot. People say, oh, that guy's got a lot of wisdom, and in fact, he may just have a lot of knowledge. And this will help you, as you go out and minister in the world, this will help you to help unbelievers see the lost reality of the utopia that they're trying to build. So let me define what I mean by knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. We have lots of knowledge. As a matter of fact, the knowledge right now in technology and in medicine in the United States is at an exponential rate. It's just exploding. You read about it all the time. We've doubled our knowledge in computers every year and a half. We've doubled our knowledge in medicine. We've doubled our knowledge in this and that. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. Wisdom is the proper application of the knowledge. And that's what the world is missing. They're constantly trying to get back to the garden. They're constantly trying to find a way to usher in utopia. The Democrats, the Republicans, this group, that group, this nation, that nation. What they don't realize is that if you take a good hard look, just a simple look at life, I started thinking about marriage. Uh, the divorce rate about 100 years ago was like 1%. Well, we've increased in our knowledge of marriage dramatically. Now it's about 35%. I don't think it's 50, but it's somewhere around 35. We know more about health than we've ever known, and we're unhealthier than we've ever been. We know more about weight loss and exercise. We're heavier than we've ever been. We know more about the mind, and there's more anxiety attacks, more depression than there has ever been. We know more about finances, and there's more bankruptcy. We know more about how to raise children, and there's more uh, rebellion than there's ever been. We know more about everything. And every single area, there is more, there's a rise in the complexity because there is a lack of wisdom. The world, because of its blindedness, doesn't see this. They always think the next medical discovery, the next fast computer, the next this, the next that, finally it's going to usher in, but it never does. We all know the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And this has been going on for 5,000 years of recorded human history. As a matter of fact, every, every uh, speech at a graduation, every single commencement speech is pretty much the same. You are the generation that's going to change the world. They get out and they can't change a diaper or a tire in a car. They're not going to change the world, and we know that. And we have to help the world understand that. And so when we look at this, this whole subject matter of wisdom and knowledge, the knowledge is just the accumulation of lots of information. But if it is not properly applied and there's no wisdom, keep this in mind. Colossians says, all wisdom and knowledge is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has to be the central person and the ultimate answer to all of these problems that we're looking at. And this is how I present these to, to lost people. I just simply say, how is it that we're increasing in, in knowledge at an exponential rate, but the problems aren't getting solved? The world doesn't really have much of an answer to that. We do. We understand that the world lacks wisdom, and that wisdom ultimately comes through the gospel. But I'd also like to address this when it comes to the fact, this also is true, I believe, in theology. We are learning, I think, more and more 
uh, through manuscript evidence and careful studies and word studies and scholarship, we're learning more and more of theology. Uh, we're get, gaining a lot of knowledge in theology. But just having a lot of knowledge, you know, you've heard the expression in Scripture, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And, but I'm not even necessarily addressing it from that standpoint. I, I'm addressing it from the standpoint of the, of the divisiveness that exists. And it's sad to me, because it would, it would seem to me that if the church was wise, universally, or in the United States, if we were wise, that there would be a lot more unity. But there's more divisiveness than I think I've ever seen in all the years I've been in ministry. And a lot of that's due to, uh, to the internet. Uh, the internet can be a very nasty place, an extremely nasty place. Uh, it's a place where you can hear somebody preach, and particularly if they're well-known, just go after them and blast them. And most of it isn't even done in love. Now, I'll admit, if there's a major key contributor to the evangelical world that goes off the deep end, denies the virgin birth or inspiration of Scripture, or the resurrection, yeah, it's time to say something. But just because we disagree with somebody on a minor issue, and I mean there are a lot of issues that have nothing to do with the gospel at all, they don't rub shoulders with the gospel, and people are just vilified. And an atheist can look at that and go, hey, folks, if you want that, join that crowd. Thanks, not me. If that's what their God is teaching them, if that's what they're like, if that's what following Jesus means, not interested. And I, I'm, I just think so much of John 17, the high priestly prayer where Jesus said, and prays that we might be one, as he and the Father are one. I think of, of Ephesians in 4 where the Apostle Paul talks about unity. It's, it's pretty much a theme in Scripture in many places. But we've, we've lost that. So I'm very, very concerned uh, that when you leave DTS, when you get back into the, into the world, when you join a church or parachurch organization or plant a church or go into missions, that you keep in mind, you keep in mind this idea that unity is very, very central. And in our theology, we can gain the, uh, theological knowledge. That's wonderful. I love to read scholarly works since I'm not a scholar. I love to see the deep insights that scholars like at this seminary provide. But ultimately, I have to have the wisdom as to how do I apply that theology in a way that is loving and kind and humble. God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. And grace that has appeared to all men teaches us. Grace is an instructor. Paul said, I, I labored more than all, the, all of them, but it wasn't me. It was the grace of God that did the laboring. And so we desperately need grace. And you get grace when you humble yourself before the Lord. So as you're getting great theological training here at DTS, wonderful training, some of the best training in the entire world, just make sure you realize that you're going to take that with you and you have to apply that and leverage that in a godly, humble way. And you'll see God do great and mighty things. So we've looked at the different swim lanes, and we've talked about wisdom versus knowledge. I'd now like to talk about the blessings along with the warfare of ministry. I'll start with the warfare. Uh, when, you, when you step in, and I'm not trying to frighten anybody, God is with us in everything, but when you step into ministry, you're, you're, you're stepping into enemy territory. You're staking claim that I'm going to advance the kingdom of God with the power of the gospel. And uh, that doesn't go over well. Uh, I've felt it for 46 years. There have been many times that I have, I've quit, <laughs> but, but I didn't quit, but I sure thought about it. Um, there are times when I thought it was too overwhelming, but then I begin, I begin to realize uh, God's callings are his enablings. What he has called you to, he will do. And if we can keep in mind that he is the one that is actually doing this through the power of the gospel, uh, we, can, we can rest more assured and more, more easily in it. Uh, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about my story because the warfare is there, but the blessings far outweigh uh, the, the, the difficulties of, of the warfare. My story goes back to being uh, in, in, at Florida Bible College, which is where Joe was, and I'm, I was sitting in chapel, and I heard a man say, he got up and he wanted me to talk to him afterwards, and I walked up and he said, uh, somebody wants to plant, have a church planted in Reston, Virginia. I didn't know anything about Reston. I made a phone call because my wife and I were planning on going someplace in Virginia to plant a church. 
So we came up here in May of 1974, and I got a job at a country club, a Reston Country Club. And that's where I met people that were coming in. I, was, I had a shoe shine concession, and I met people, and I would invite them to the first Bible study, which was going to be in June on a Tuesday night. And it was very hard getting people to come out. But eventually, people started coming. I'd give the gospel every week, and people started getting saved, and it grew. And then in March of 1975, we started Reston Bible Church. One of the most embarrassing times of my life was while I was shining shoes, because this was an extra way for me to make money, I had a glorified locker room attendant position. Uh, I, I heard these cleats drop down. I was getting ready to clean this guy's shoes, and I looked up, and it was a classmate of mine from the Naval Academy. And that's another story. I spent four years in the Naval Academy. That's another, no we don't have time to get into that. Uh, and this guy looked at me and said, Mike Minter, what in the world are you doing? And I said, well, I'm shining shoes, Joe. And uh, we ended up talking, and he eventually came to, came to Christ, and we still stay much in touch. But through the years, one thing that I learned in Bible college was to always, always, always give the gospel. Make sure that your message flows into the gospel. And so for years, all through these years, every message I've ever given, I have always explained that the righteousness that you need to enter into the kingdom of God is the righteousness of Christ placed to your account. And I go through a quick uh, statement of the gospel. And through the years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have come to know Christ. Um, we just had a, a couple of young ladies that, uh, I say young, <laughs> actually they're not that young, uh, just retired today. We just had a staff meeting and said goodbye to them. Uh, together they've put in about 60 years of ministry here. And one of them came to know Christ about 30 years ago when they, when they first started coming. They heard the gospel, she and her husband. I remember um, a number of years ago when we were meeting in a high school, um, there was a, a young girl that came, somebody invited her, and she was 18 years old, and she was leaving the next week to go move to Colorado. And she came into the church service, and all of a sudden, you know, I close with the gospel. She bows her head and calls upon Christ to save her. Then she moves. Years later, she writes me and says, you don't know me, but I attended uh, Reston Bible Church one time, and I heard the gospel. I just want to say thank you. I'm now married to a youth pastor in Colorado. Those kind of things warm your heart. I had a, a man come up to me in the lobby of our church that we're in right now, this building that I'm speaking from right now. A couple of years ago, he walked up to me and he goes, hi, my name's Dave, and we shook hands, and I said, hi, Dave, nice to meet you, and he goes, actually, I, uh, I'm here to complain. Uh, I just wanna, I wanna thank you so much for ruining my life. And I said, ruining your life? He goes, yeah. He said, many, many years ago, I was 18 years old, and and there was a real pretty girl that was attending Reston Bible Church, and I really wanted to see her, so I came in that Sunday, and, and she wasn't there. And I stayed for the service anywhere, and you gave the gospel at the end. And I was getting ready to go to college, and my plans were to live the most debauched life possible. I was going to do the party thing. I was going to drink and be involved in every immoral thing you could possibly imagine. And I heard the gospel, and I put my faith in Christ, and I remained pure and clean for four straight years, so thanks so much for ruining the party life. Of course, he was being sarcastic. But I thought, that just so warms my heart. And I, I, I could tell you, it has nothing to do with me. It's the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe when the gospel is presented. And so I, I, I give it every Sunday, and it's just a joy to hear people walk up and say, I've been coming here for four years or five years, and today it finally made sense. Today, it sunk in. Today, I, I, I came to the realization of the great truth of Christ, so thank you. And I, I'm just, I've been privileged to be able to do that through the years and to see so many people come to know Christ. I all, have also had the privilege of, of seeing people that have been in this church for years and years and years, have come on staff and have been with us for years and years. One thing I... I'm so thankful for, we don't have a whole lot of turnover. We have about 40 people on staff. And when they come on, they're usually with us for many, many years. Uh, I think of, of Eric Smith, who is not on staff, uh, but he's the chairman of our elders. And when I first came to Reston, his, his parents started coming 45 years ago. And Eric was about 13 years old, and I was 30. 
And he's been coming ever since, and he's now the chairman. He knows the Bible 20 times better than I do. I, I, maybe 100. The guy is, uh, and he's a carpenter. He just knows the scriptures inside and out. I look at Eric at elder meetings, I'm thinking, praise God for the gospel. Praise God for the power of the gospel. I think of uh, Bob Scholl, our youth pastor. He's been here for 32 or 33 years. Another friend of mine left just a while ago, uh, Paul Goodnight, been with me for 25 years. The man filming this has been here for about 17 years. His kids have been raised here. Uh, it, it just goes on and on and on. The blessings, the blessings of ministry. I got plugged into missions thanks to Ron Blue, who, who was one of our speakers, Ramesh Richards, um, hearing another pastor in the area encourage me in missions many, many years ago, 40 some years ago. I knew nothing about missions. So I got a bunch of guys together and said, figure out what missions is and let's get involved in it. I think it has something to do with going overseas and telling people in different parts of the world about Christ. That's about how much I knew about missions. And through the years, we've been privileged to give about $45 million to world missions. We have many, many missionaries throughout the world and continue to contribute a great deal to world missions. And I've probably made 35 or 40 different trips to many different places in the world and been so blessed. I'm currently pretty much focused on the Amazon with Justice Mercy International. Uh, at my age, at 76, I still have uh, a, a little kick in my step so I can still go, but I just don't go as often or as much. Uh, travel it takes a little bit more out of me, but uh, still very much involved in missions and certainly encourage you, whether you're going into missions or planting a church, get involved in world evangelization. And I know that Dallas has been involved in that for many, many years. And I would say this to all of you that are getting ready to graduate or you're here and you're, 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 maybe you're starting out at Dallas. My passion, if I have one thing that I want written on my tombstone is that this man did everything he could to unify the body of Christ without compromising sound doctrine. I can't tell you where you draw that line but we've drawn too many lines. We're getting to the point where we're just so narrow-minded. There are whole websites devoted to scoping out anybody who isn't theologically sound according to them. And it's, it's, uh, it's become nasty and abrasive, and it's very disturbing to my soul. And when I read scripture, I just don't see it's very Christ-like. There are certain things we have to fall on the sword about. There's no question about it. But I just would encourage you to have a passion and a desire to want to see unity come. Because when unity comes, I think you're going to see revival. I often tell our people uh, that unity is the fruit of corporate humility. Unity is the fruit of corporate humility. When there's corporate humility, there'll be unity. When we see corporate humility throughout the United States, there'll be unity, and I think you're going to see revival take place. So I'd strongly encourage you in that. And then lastly, I would say this. Uh, we are in the process of looking for my, uh, my successor. We love Dallas Theological Seminary. We haven't put this out everywhere. Uh, but if you know of anybody, faculty, staff, uh, students, you know of somebody, we're looking for somebody between uh, 35, 45 time frame that's got some education, that likes to preach. Um, and uh, we'd love to... Get your resume so you can contact us here at Reston Bible Church by getting a hold of Bruce Campbell, our executive pastor. Bruce Campbell at restonbible.org. That's a little advertisement there. Well, I'd like to close with this. Sometimes I tell our people, uh, I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two, to borrow from the ad. I've been around long enough to have learned a great deal. Uh, I'm not a scholar, but I have a lot of a lot of knowledge and I think some wisdom in the area of just dealing with people and church work and church environment and building a good teams. But my great passion right now as I'm drawing out to the, the last lap in my, in my life is to see a great deal of unity come to the body of Christ. That's my great passion. And I wanna see that uh, taught in seminaries and brought to the world because the world needs the gospel. And the gospel can't come with lots of divisiveness and, and vitriol. It's got to come with love and humility and compassion for those that have not heard the gospel. And so I'm 
deeply uh, grateful and indebted to Dallas Theological Seminary for so much of what it's taught me through the years. I've listened to some of your uh, tapes and podcasts and, and messages as I was, again, cutting my teeth on theology. So many thanks to you. What I'd like to do is close in a word of prayer and ask a blessing on this seminary, faculty, staff, and all that are in, involved in teaching. Father, what a great uh, teaching ministry Dallas has and has had through the years. And I do pray for the faculty, for the staff, for the students, Lord, that you would use them in ways far beyond anything they could ask or think. Lord, that the gospel would go to the ends of the earth because of what this seminary has trained their students to do. And now, Father, I pray that you would bless and encourage each of our lives, even this very day, encourage our hearts, and we'll give you all the glory as we pray it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Thanks for this opportunity and this time.